that'll sure wake you up, huh? <laughs> Good morning. And welcome, welcome, welcome to the First Universalist Church of Rochester, where we are called to nurture the spirit and to serve the community. I am Reverend Lane Mary Campbell, and it is my privilege and my honor to serve this congregation as your settled minister. I use they, them pronouns. Joining me in leading worship this morning is our worship associate, Elizabeth Osta, using she, her pronouns. We have Howard Spindler joining us this morning for doing our music, using he, him pronouns, as well as Damien Spindler on the trumpet, also using he, him pronouns. Joining us for our tech support today is Jim Milch and Michael Scott, both using he, him pronouns. We also have Ezekiel McGee holding down our online ministry using they, them pronouns, as well as John Luke's using he, him pronouns. It takes so many people to make this service possible every Sunday morning. If you are here for the first, second, or third time, we are so grateful you have made it to this worshiping space. Thank you so much. Uh, we are um, delighted that you are here and certainly will offer you a greeting this morning. But we'd also love to invite you to please fill out the visitor's form in your order of service or to click, click the link in your um, chat if you're joining us online um, so that we can offer you a welcome beyond just what we can offer you this morning. So please be sure to fill that out and let us know who you are and let us know that you're here. Uh, this, today, this morning, after our service, our stewardship team is going to be inviting us into a, a time of dreaming over here in the back of our sanctuary. So please feel free to stick around after the service and join us in contributing. What are some of your dreams for First Universalist Church? Whether you've been here for 50 years or this is your first Sunday, we want to incorporate your dreams for this place and this space. So please stick around, uh, come back after coffee hour, come and dream with us today. Uh, before we take a moment to turn to our neighbors here in uh, this worshiping uh, space at First Universalist and online, let us take a moment to connect our online communities and our in-person communities. So please turn towards hope back over this way and offer a wave to our online folks. We are so grateful you are here today and joining us. And uh, please, you know, if you are joining us online, please pop into the chat and offer a greeting. Let us know where you're Zooming in from today. And if you're here in person, please turn to your neighbor and offer a greeting. Let's sing! <laughs> it's always so good. This is such a good part of our service. I feel terrible pulling you back from it. But this morning, we are going to be talking a lot about love. And so please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing hymn number 325, Love Makes a Bridge. Please note, we are singing verses 1 through 3 and then verse 5. Uh, so please rise in body or in spirit. Howard's going to play it for us one time through before we start singing.
Please be seated. A beautiful song about love's power. Good morning again. What's love got to do with it? The popular song by Tina Turner asked that question. The answer, everything. And yet, what we know of love is often changing and mystifying. Its boundaries continually being explored and expanded, renewed and realized. Amidst war and all the earthly evils that we witness and endure, we seek words of truth and light to guide us. We are blessed that there are strong voices to help lead us. One such voice is the feminist author, activist, and academic, Bell Hooks, whose death in December 2021 has brought her brilliant work as a trailblazer within the intersectional feminism movement into greater focus. She tells us, Love is an action, never simply a feeling. Hooks, studying to be a poet at Stanford, ultimately met up with three American Buddhist nuns who left a great impression on her young mind. This was the beginning of her lifelong immersion in Buddhist contempl contemplative practice, which in turn came to permeate her own work and worldview including her understanding of love. She writes, if love is really the active practice, Buddhist, Christian, or Islamic mysticism, it requires the notion of being a lover, of being in love with the universe. To commit to love is fundamentally to commit to a life beyond dualism. That's why love is so sacred in a culture of domination, because it simply begins to erode your dualisms, dualisms of black and white, male and female, right and wrong. It is with this gift of clarity and crystal sharpness given by this brilliant woman of color that we are lifted. In the light of such love, come, let us worship. Would Beth Ayers, or as Beth Ayers, lights our chalice at First Universalist, and you light your chalice in your own homes, will you join me in saying the chalice words in unison? May we be a people of welcome, here to grow in heart and mind and spirit. And may we reach out to serve our community. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in our affirmation of faith followed by our sung offering. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the source and meaning of life. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all. As we prepare our hearts for generosity this morning, let us sing our sung offering together. The chant is simple. What we need is here. Words by Amy McFreeth, and it goes like this. What we need is here. What we need is here. A couple times. What we need is here. What we need 
Please be seated. It is said that a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. When asked, a high percentage of study respondents who decided to spread their life through generosity said that they actually gained something. 74% of high generosity people reported that they were satisfied with their lives. Each Sunday, we are offered an opportunity to increase our happiness through our generosity. Holding a door, listening to a friend, sharing what we can to support our church. That's happiness. May ours be a happy day. This morning's offering will now be gratefully received. You are invited by scanning the QR code in your pews to give or to drop an offering in the offering basket. For folks online, please click the chat in the chat to give to First Universalist. Thank you for your generosity. Here's to your happiness.
Thank you so much. Our story this morning is a story called Babu's Song, and it's a story by Stephanie Stuve Bodine and illustrated by Aaron Boyd. Uh, Reverend, Reverend Michelle has adapted it for us this morning and selected this story, yet could not be with us today, so you'll just have to deal with me this morning. <laughs> Um, uh, this story is a little bit of the gift of the Magi-ish, so just so you know. Prepare, prepare your tissues. Bernardi didn't care that he was the only boy on the field, not wearing a school uniform. You see him there in the red. He loved soccer, and his one concern was making a goal, but the final kick Bernardi sent the ball flying past the goalie and into the net. A whistle blew, and others went into the school. Bernardi wished he could go to the school like the other children. He liked to learn, and then he could play soccer every day, not just when they needed an extra player. Bernardi lived with his grandfather, Babu. They did not have enough money for school. When Bernardi got home, Babu gave him a hug. This is how he said hello, because an illness had taken his voice. Babu held up a figure made of wood. He pulled a string, and the figure's arms and legs popped up and down, making Bernardi laugh. Babu was a toy maker. He had only to look at an object, and he knew what toy it would become. After Babu made his toys and Bernardi would sell them, together they made enough money to live on. Babu made tea for Bernardi and himself. After they finished, Bernardi took an old bag, waved goodbye to Babu, and set off for the market. As he walked, Babu hummed a tune that Babu had sung when he had his voice. Anything for Babu? Bernardi asked the vendors when he reached the market. The vendors gave Bernardi bits of string or paper, anything that Babu might use to be able to make his toys. Mama Valentina handed him a plastic gunny sack, and Bernardi thanked her, even though he didn't think Babu could use it. As Bernardi walked home, he passed a shop and looked in the window. There, amongst the bolts of cloth and shiny pots, was a new soccer ball. Bernardi pressed his face against the window and looked at the price. It was more than the cost to go to school. Let that sit for a second. Slowly, Bernardi backed away from the window. He did not hum as he walked home. That evening, Babu and Bernardi ate beans and rice by the light of the kerosene lamp. Babu put something by Bernardi's plate. It looked like a tin of lard. He opened the lid and heard a small tink, tink, tinkling. A music box, Bernardi exclaimed, and listened again. It was rough and tinny, but he recognized the tune. It was Babu's song, the one he had hummed before. Bernardi hugged Babu, and together they listened to music. That night, for the first time in many nights, ba Bernardi fell asleep listening to Babu's song. The next Saturday was the day Bernardi sold toys to tourists. He set up shop arranging the toys on the curb. Bernardi cranked the music box and listened as Babu's song tinkled out. He had sold a few things when a woman picked up the music box. She had asked how much it was, but Bernardi said it wasn't for sale. The woman did not give up. She told Bernardi that she wanted the music box for her collection and held out a handful of money. Bernardi's eyes widened. It would be more than enough money to buy the ball in the store window. Surely Babu could make another music box? Bernardi swallowed hard and took the money. After Bernardi sold all the toys, he headed for the shops down the street. I sold Everything, Babu, Bernardi said when he got home. He was trying to sound cheerful, but then a tear rolled down his face. Babu went over and wiped his grandson's face and waited. He knew Bernardi would tell him what was wrong. Bernardi sniffed. 
He told Babu about the music box and the soccer ball. I don't want the ball anymore, he said. He held out the money. Take it, Babu. You decide what to do with the money. Babu took the money and looked thoughtfully at Bernardi for a long time. Then he broke into a smile, signaled Bernardi to wait, and walked out the door. Bernardi waited for Babu, wishing he still had the music box. How could he have sold it? When Babu returned, he pulled out a package and handed it to Bernardi. Bernardi choked back a sob. He untied the package. His eyes opened wide. It was a school uniform. You paid for me to go to school? Babu nodded. Bernardi jumped up and hugged his grandfather. Babu went back outside and returned holding something behind his back. With a flourish, Babu held out a soccer ball made from string and Valentina's gunny sack. Bernardi put down his uniform and held the ball. He bounced it on one knee, and it felt like the real thing. Thank you, Babu. It's wonderful, Bernardi said to his grandfather and gave him a hug. Babu beamed. Bernardi decided that the ball was even better than the real thing. Babu pulled out one more surprise. It was an empty, large tin. As Babu began to make another music box, Bernardi put the water on the stove to boil. Then Bernardi hummed Babu's song as they sat in the lamplight and waited for their tea. A story about the actions we take out of love, the generosity that pours forth from those of us who experience love and the ways that that lands for those we love. The end. As we invite any children present with us to go upstairs for activities in our child care room and also as we here in this sanctuary prepare our hearts for joys and sorrows as well as our prayer, let us join in singing our doxology from our seats. Oh, we'll take a moment to get up to the organ. (laughs) Thanks, Howard. (laughs) Yeah, no, yeah, you were enthralled in the story. I get it. I totally get it. (laughs) It takes a minute to get. (laughs) So let us prepare our hearts in singing our doxology. Please be seated. And oh my gosh, without Rev. Michelle here, I totally forgot. This is our Food in Gathering Sunday. Uh, So if folks have any uh, food that they would like to bring forward for our Nestor Street food cupboard, we have our baskets up here if you'd like to bring that forward now at this time. If anybody has food that they haven't yet already put in here, you can lift it up and someone will come around and collect it from you, for you, awesome. Thanks, Johanna. So yeah, Sage, do you want to come forward and collect some of this food and bring it up? Fantastic. Thanks, Sage. We appreciate you helping us out there. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, sweetie. Appreciate it. Dear ones, I want to invite you into this reverent time of sharing the joys and the sorrows of our gathered community. If you would like to, if it feels good to you, you can place a hand over your heart 
from wherever you are worshiping with us today, to be able to listen from this heart-centered, heart-grounded place. As Elizabeth places stones into the bowl, I will read aloud the joys and the sorrows of our gathered community. All online are invited to share joys and sorrows in the chat, and we will read them aloud here in this sanctuary. We share two joys uh, this morning from Richard Reed. The first being a great trumpet concert Friday night featuring Damien Spindler and fantastic Oh, and the second being a fantastic presentation yesterday by myself and Reverend Michelle and the proposal for the changes to be voted on at June, uh, at, at General Assembly in June for our UUA bylaws. I'll talk about that more later. A joy from Kelly Scott this morning. I have 30 years sober today. My God, yes, that is. Happy anniversary, 30 years, one day at a time, my dear. We share our gratitude this morning for, uh, from Marty Eggers. Uh, I'm grateful for all the support my church family gave me when my little Hershey crossed over the Rainbow Bridge a few weeks ago, a beloved dog to this community. Until you've had the experience yourself, you don't know how much it means. And... Also a joy, my grandson Cal brought down the house at Brighton High School this past weekend as Spongebob in Spongebob the Musical. (laughs) Get it, Cal. Incredible. Well, we share, um, uh, I believe, I'm not sure who is sharing this. Uh, joy. Um, But this week, I traveled to Albany with my husband to talk to legislators about disability issues for the New York Association, uh, from Erica, fantastic, for the New York Association on Independent Living. I am so excited to share my passion. Erica, our hearts go with you as you make your way this week. Are there other joys or sorrows from our online community as, as well? Is there anything above that? All right. This morning we also share two sorrows. A sorrow from Cindy Gibson. Sadly, my sister was diagnosed with stage three uterine cancer this week, awaiting treatment recommendations as we move forward on this journey. Cindy, our love and our hearts are with you. We also share a sorrow on behalf of our entire First Universalist community. This morning we are saddened to share that longtime member of this congregation, Marie Sidoti, died this past Sunday, February 4th. A memorial service is planned at First Universalist Church for Saturday, March 9th at 11 a.m. with a reception to follow. We are holding all in this community as well as Marie's family in our hearts this morning. She will be missed. We also hold that we are a church that is a worshiping community that is meeting in a time of war. We acknowledge the wars and the conflicts that are happening in Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, the Congo, and Sudan. We acknowledge that there are more conflicts and wars happening that we are not even aware of, and we grieve the losses of life, both on behalf of the military members who are of service to our country, the military members who serve in a time of war, and of course, the people, the civilians, the families, the men, the women, the children, the non-combatants who are dying our world over due to war. We earnestly pray this morning for these wars to cease. Let us drop a stone to acknowledge the grief we feel in this sanctuary and wherever we are worshiping from. May we hold the grief of those across the world living with immense loss, displacement, poverty, and atrocity. Let us be connected by our grief. And we will also drop a stone to acknowledge the joy the resilience, the tenacity found in life that still makes life worth living in the midst of so many horrors. 
We know that there are ways the people who are at war are still finding ways to survive and hopefully still finding glimpses of joy. Let us continue to be connected by this life force to those living through the direct impact and loss while at war in their homes, their backyards, and their country. We will hold a brief moment of silence to honor the many deaths that have happened this past week due to wars across our world. May we hold silence here in this space and out of our silence here and our shared grief and our shared joy, find ways to continue to speak. As we drop one final stone into the bowl to represent all of the joys and the sorrows left unspoken in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts, we are reminded this morning that all, all, all are held in the heart of love. I want to invite you now into a prayerful moment with me. This morning, prepare your hearts, your spirits, your bodies, whatever that looks like for you today. Take a deep breath. Close your eyes. Relax into this moment and open your hearts in prayer. Spirit, we hold hope for love's healing power in the midst of all that we grieve in this world. We hold hope that love can transform hearts that have gone cold even our own. We hold hope that love can soften us towards one another. We hold hope that love will continue to guide us along our life's journey. Love has shown up in our days in so many ways this week. Let us just take a moment right here in this prayerful time to bring to mind when love has shown up for us in recent days. Where love has shown up through the actions of another. Through a softening of our own heart. In community. We embrace gratitude for this powerful force running through each of us. We embrace gratitude for the faces with whom we have experienced love. Thank you for the ways love showed up with us, for its sweetness felt in our spirits. And as we pray this morning, let us also turn our hearts towards lament. May we find forgiveness for the moments when we have believed that love is not enough. May we hold that each one of us in this room has broken a heart and has had their heart broken. May we acknowledge the times we tried to make our love small, to hide it away out of fear of abandonment, or rejection. May we be present to the moments when we ourselves fell short of love's call. In prayer, spirit, may we be reminded that this day is a day to begin again. 
Let us hear love's call to risk. Let us hear love's call towards relationship. Let us hear love's call to be our best selves. Let us hear hear love's call towards hope. For this and for all the ways we experience love, we are so grateful. Amen. Blessed be, and may it be so. Let us hold in our silence, in our shared silence this morning, all of the ways that love continues to show up for us and to call us, to call to us and to guide us. As we join voices in our hymn of contemplation this morning, our hymn is Loosen, Loosen by Ali Halpert. It has two parts. And so we will sing through the first part three times. And then we'll sing through the second part three times. And then we're going to weave them together.
we'll start with part one. Loosen, loosen, baby. You don't have to carry little burdens in your muscles and bones. Let go, let go. And you can keep singing that, or we can bring in part two. As we continue to stay soft towards love, it is good to sing together about all that we do not need to hold and the ways that we can hold pain and share pain together. As it is Super Bowl Sunday, I want to share with y'all a little story from a couple of years ago. It's a story about my dear colleague, Dick Gilbert, and my other colleague at First Unitarian, Reverend Sherry Halliday Kwan. See, the three of us found out that we have something in common, and it is a shared love of football. And so we decided last football season, that what we were going to do was we were going to head out to a game together. We packed up my car, got all our tailgating resources together. I made too much food for three people. And we took, we took my car, we headed out west to Buffalo. On the way, my car popped a flat tire, but that's a story for another day. We ended up tailgating by the side of the highway. It was wonderful. <laughs> But we made it. We made it to Buffalo. And even though I was anxious about whether or not we'd be able to find parking, we slid right into parking on somebody's lawn. And we made our way up the street toward Orchard Park to go to the stadium. The three of us, along with all these throngs of fans, folks shouting, yelling things to one another, it was really fun and super exciting. We arrived to the ticket counter, tickets in hand, ready to go in. And when we got in through the gate, their promotions people handed us a towel. And on the, t the towel, it said, choose love. Now, the three of us had a little chuckle about this, obviously. As folks who are Unitarian Universalists, with Universalist tendencies, this message to choose love just seemed a little too on the nose. And it was wonderful that throughout the game, we were surrounded by folks with these towels, holding them up and yelling, choose love. Now, one could make the argument that the National Football League could be doing a better job at this right now. <laughs> One could make the argument with all of the concussions and the ways that the National Football League often chooses money over love, love of money over love of people, that maybe the National Football League could be living into this a little bit better. But this morning sort of sets the tone for what I have to talk to you all about today, which is around the ways that we make the choice to choose love and what love calls us towards as Unitarian Universalists and as people of this faith. Yesterday morning, as Richard Reed mentioned in his joy, 
a group, a, a group of folks from First Universalist gathered to talk about some proposed changes to our bylaws for our Unitarian Universalist Association. Not the most sexy topic, but we'll get there. Our denomination has decided to review and change Article 2 of our bylaws, a thing that we are supposed to do every 15 years, according to such bylaws. Turns out it's actually been 40 years since they were last reviewed. It's not just, you know, those, unitar those of us here in the room who can be late to the party. But in these revisions they are making, the proposal has us doing away with our seven principles of Unitarian Universalism in favor of shared values, statements about the values we hold in common and that hold us together. These shared values include equity, interdependence, justice, generosity, pluralism, and transformation. All of these values held with love at the center. All keeping love at the very core of what we do, the reason why we value what we value, the element of life and living that is at the literal heart of who we are as Unitarian Universalists. If you missed yesterday's session, resources from it will be sent out this upcoming week so you can see what we talked about. But what I want you to know is that Unitarian Universalism is leaning into the opportunity to clarify who we are and what we value and the highest held value at the center of it all is love. Now, if we are going to hold love at the center, we should probably have a working definition of what it means. M. Scott Peck, in his seminal work, The Road Less Traveled, defines love as the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual, inner spiritual growth. So let me say it all again. The will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's inner spiritual growth. He wrote this definition decades ago, but it is still relevant today. It is a definition that is widely used, widely quoted. He builds on it by saying, love is as love does. Love is an act of will, namely both an intention and an action. Will also implies choice. We do not have to love. We choose love. You see, the Buffalo Bills didn't know that they were quoting M. Scott Peck and what they were doing, but here we are. Love is an active choice that we each get to make. See, I imagine that those of you who are in this room, who have been in love for a long time, know what I mean by making intentional choices. Because those of you here who have been in love for a long time, whether with someone else, with yourself, or with many people, have had to make choices. You have had to choose this person and to choose yourself again and again and again. In moments when things have gotten hard, when conflict is high, when you are not sure you still even like this person, you have had to choose to remain in one another's lives. In moments when you have gone through your own personal crisis, or even in times when you didn't like yourself very much, you have had to choose yourself rather than abandoning yourself. To love is to want for the spiritual growth of another and of yourself, and that choice is not always easy. That choice requires action on our part. As Valentine's Day approaches, it is easy to hear a lot about falling in love. And pardon my French, but I think it's a whole bunch of BS. 
The falling can only get us so far. And sure, it is sweet. It is sweet. But the real challenge, the real task is in the choosing. And I'm not just talking about choosing one's romantic partner here, though I am talking about that. I also think we choose to love friends, communities, children, peoples, places. I choose to be here in Rochester, in the place where you all called me to this ministry six years ago. And I choose this place again and again, wanting for its spiritual growth, wanting for this city to be thriving, to be connected, to be a place of spirit. My relationship to this place could just be about where I ended up for a job. But it is in the choosing, in my choosing, that I have come to love this city as my home. We have a choice in who and what we love. And with those choices comes responsibility. Aaliyah Black, who is an author, social worker, and specialist working with folks looking to recover from people-pleasing behaviors, helps us to better claim choice in our loving and take responsibility for our choices. They invite us to debunk this myth of falling in love or falling prey to our desires. They write, I don't have control over my actions when I'm attracted to someone is a lie that our violent culture taught you. Women are taught helplessness to desire through the myth of passivity. Patriarchy tells us that women don't have sexual urges. This is a lie that hurts people. It disempowers women from creating boundaries and saying no. It paints them as passive. It reinforces rape culture. It invisibilizes queerness. Men are taught helplessness to desire through the myth of insatiability. Patriarchy tells us that men have insatiable sexual urges. This is a lie that hurts people. They are seen as beastly. When the hypersexual drive in the first place speaks to a desire for more connection and closeness, we are told over and over through rape trials and romance novels and supposed love stories that we are all helpless to desire and out of our own control. Desire is holy. Take responsibility for yours. Part of overcoming internalized patriarchy is acknowledging your sexual desires, the beauty and the embarrassment. Your divine desires and, yes, your dumb decisions. There are ways to experience the erotic loss of control without crossing boundaries, self-sabotage, or being unethical. What is it that you want? And maybe more to the point for today, what is it that you are choosing? This is about more than sexual desire, of course, here. This is about how taking away our ability to actively choose hurts possibilities for connection and closeness. It is about how expectations of affection can be steeped in patriarchy rather than acknowledging each and every one of us as human. This piece about falling in love, taking away our power, our agency, our ability to make choices. We must take responsibility for our choices. We choose love. Love is not just something that happens to us. And I know many of us, many of us in this room, if not all of us, have been shown unhealthy models of what love looks like. I know many of us, no matter what gender we have been raised in, socialized as, or transitioned towards, we have learned what unhealthy love looks like. I imagine there are stories in this space of relationships of all kinds where spiritual growth was not even an option, not on the table at all. I know there are stories in here of moments when our love was taken for granted or even actively neglected. 
and abused when we ourselves were abused. Both Elizabeth and I were thinking along the same lines around black scholar and activist and author Bell Hooks. In one of her writings, she builds on M. Scott Peck's seminal text, her book All About Love, which if you have not read, I highly recommend. She shares this extra dimension to Peck's definition. When we understand love as the will to nurture our own and another's spiritual growth, it becomes clear that we cannot claim to love if we are hurtful and abusive. Love and abuse cannot coexist. Abuse and neglect are, by definition, the opposites of nurturance and care. I really appreciate her writing about this with such clarity. I really appreciate the ways that this definition of love as making the choice to nurture the spiritual growth of ourselves and others actually means that love cannot coexist with abuse. That to abuse is to act outside of the interest of one's own and another's spiritual growth. That love is a power we all possess, a gift we give to ourselves and others inherent in each of us not to be neglected, not to be abused. As people who keep love at the center, there are certainly moments when we fall short of this ideal to want for the spiritual growth of ourselves and another. There are times when we do not do this perfectly, and I am certainly not saying that what we should be striving for is to perfectly live up to these definitions. Perfection makes no room for the messy moments of failing to make choices in the interest of spiritual growth and the moments when we must take responsibility by apologizing and taking corrective action. Sometimes the actions we take in service to love are silly. I imagine many of us have been there and can hopefully laugh at ourselves about what we have done. But there is also ways that we must take responsibility for the moments when we have fallen short. Acting in love is far from something any of us can do perfectly, but we do it nonetheless because we know that love's rewards are great. A favorite hymn of this congregation, love will guide us, right? Love guides us towards actions that express our care and nurturance for another. Love guides us to keep choosing ourselves and those in our lives who will love us in return. Love is an empowering force in our lives. The choices we make empowering us to act for justice, empowering us to act compassionately, empowering us to take actions that bring us closer to others, finding belonging where we need to as a fundamental part of being human. To love feels good. To choose love feels good. It is what guided our universalist ancestors towards the love of God rather than fear and punishment. It is our legacy our inheritance, our way of being in the world to love, to keep love at the center. A choice made for the spiritual growth of ourselves and another is a powerful choice. It is a gift. Let us continue to allow love to guide us, to choose love and to keep love at the center of all that we do. Let us continue to act with love to those around us, towards our communities, and especially with ourselves. Amen. Blessed be, and may it be so. Though we know this morning that there is a lot of love here in this space, we will also join in singing hymn number 95, There is more love somewhere. 
please rise in body and spirit and join us in singing. As we hold the hope, the love, the joy, the peace that we find here, let us extinguish our chalice this morning with our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. Let us take a moment and place our hands over our hearts. Take a moment to look around in this room and see who is here with you on this journey. For folks joining us online, turn on your cameras. We can see you here with us. Take a look at who is along this journey, moving with us and learning to continue to love. Love one another, love ourselves, love our communities, love better. Dear ones, I hope you can feel it this morning. I hope you can feel love's power and the gift of love here. Because you choose to be here in this community with these people this morning. And as we say every Sunday as we go out, May you know that you yourself are loved. And may you go and be that love, bring that love to whomever you meet in the days, moments, and weeks ahead. Amen. Blessed be. And may it be so.